Hi, Bill Tabone here, co-founder of the Australian Paranormal Society and author of Ghosts of Airedale Asylum, and you're listening to Ghosts in the Valley podcast. Enjoy. Ghosts in the Valley podcast. I'm your host, Al Cooley. Today I have Patrick Meacham. Patrick is the author of Nightmare in Holmes County, and also he is the author of 225th Street. Both are fantastic paranormal books that are available now on Amazon, and I'll be back with my conversation with Patrick Meacham right after these brief messages. Do exorcisms intrigue you? Do you like scary urban legends? Are you fascinated with history and ghostly lore of haunted places? Well, if you answered yes to any of these, please check out Hauntingly Yours, a podcast for the paranormal. I'm your host, DC O'Rourke. I invite you to get together with me and the rest of our para family each and every week to hear haunting tales from across the globe. The show is available on all podcast players. Please do not forget to review and subscribe. Today I have Patrick Meachin, author of Nightmare in Holmes County and 225th Street. Uh, I personally own Nightmare in Holmes County. It's a fantastic, fantastic book. Uh, Patrick not only battled the haunted house, but he also had to battle some of the, uh, uh, let's say, uh, bad Amish. And these books are very reasonably priced, uh, available on Amazon and Kindle, or just great reads. Uh, welcome to the show, Patrick. Thank you. I appreciate it. And uh, thank you for the kind words. Uh, Nightmare in Holmes County is definitely a unique book. It does kind of deal with the whole haunted house thing, but also a lot of the the, the dark magic, or you know, we we can say among the Amish, uh, uh, there's a lot of witchcraft and and uh, sorcery and and Satanism that goes on among uh, the Amish. Um, I'm not saying they all do it, but it is very prevalent. You know, a lot of times when we talk about you know, living in a haunted house or growing up in a haunted house, I mean, or dealing with anything paranormal can be shocking. Yes. Uh, did you have any uh, experiences as a child uh, with paranormal or uh, was that house the first time? I, I had experiences here and there that were strange growing up that I thought were interesting. I always had an interest in, uh, you know, this kind of thing. And I always believed in it, but um, I never had anything really to the level that I experienced in Holmes County and then later in, in uh, 225th Street. I, I never had anything to that level, but I did have things that I really couldn't explain you know, growing up, you know, some things here and there, definitely. Well, starting with your first book, I was curious because, you know, you, you lived in Holmes County and that's only a couple counties over from myself uh, in Trumbull County. Okay. So, I you know, my wife and I, we go to Holmes County quite a bit. Uh, she loves all the Amish stores in that uh, in that area, mm -hmm. and I read the book and I was like, "Wow, I was blown away." I still got to pick up the second one yet, you know. But mm -hmm. the uh, the first one, let's start with that one. I mean, when you first moved in the house, was it was it normal? Not really. Uh, we actually built the house. We we were looking at a piece of land in Wayne County, mm -hmm. and when I say we, I'm talking about me and my now ex wife. Uh, we were looking at a piece of land in Wayne County. And the uh, gentleman we hired uh, to build the house, he directed us to another piece of land he thought would be more to our liking in Holmes County. So basically, it was a nice piece of land. It was surrounded by Amish farms. Um, it was a beautiful scenery for sure. You know, so that was in the fall of 2001. You know, we thought, you know, we're going to live out here. It's going to be peaceful and quiet and just beautiful everywhere we look, you know. Mm -hmm. the, they, they broke ground in early 2002. And by March, we had a situation that was strange. Uh, I got a call one Saturday night at work from the builder. And he said, I, I didn't want to talk to your wife and tell her. He said, I did not want to tell her what I have to tell you. He said, um, a, a storm came through and your house is demolished. 
and uh, it, it was literally flattened. Now it had been, you know, by that time they had the footer poured, all the basement walls built, the whole two stories built. They were nailing. Uh, so I'm talking the framework and everything, but they were nailing on the outer walls. So it was definitely coming together, but it was two full stories built already. This freak storm came through the area and just completely flattened the house. You know, there's pictures, there's a picture in the book of the house completely demolished and I'm standing there looking at it, you know, mm-hmm. and at the, at the time I just thought, well, it's, it's bad luck, you know, so to speak. And the builder would keep saying, and now keep in mind, he was in his late sixties at that point. He was not Amish, but he was raised Amish and he had left the Amish church. He still subcontracted uh, his jobs to the Amish. So he was in very thick with them. But I say all that to, to say that, you know, being he was brought up Amish, he had been working construction almost his entire life. Amish kids start hard work early in life. They are taught. One thing I'll say for them is they're taught a very good work ethic. Mm-hmm. And that's something, that, you know, probably lacking in some areas and other yeah. parts, you know, outside of the uh, Amish community. But, you know, he, when I'm, I'm saying that, because he had a lot of experience. And when he is saying, I have, he kept saying, I have never seen anything like this before. They basically tore up everything, uh, sold off all the wood, because that was a lot of wood, you know, that they, they got rid of then. Sold it to, auctioned it off, supposedly, whatever. <laughs> I say supposedly, because that kind of <laughs> stuff has, it's always a little bit fixed in that area. Mm-hmm. You know, they started building again. And as the house began coming together, there were little strange things that, but I didn't, I didn't think in any way the house was haunted, you know, like I would go to the house at night after work. Now, keep in mind, it was in Amish country, surrounded by Amish farms. There's, um, you know, it's, it's pitch black out there. You know, there's no farms close to us. We're, we're off by ourselves in this valley. I would be out there working and I would have a very overwhelming feeling that I was being watched. And I would think, well, you're in a house that you, you know, it's all new. You know, you, you're, you're not familiar with this area and it's all dark outside. It's just eerie. That's all it is. There's nothing here, you know? And I started taking a, a boom box and I would play like worship music, Christian music, which definitely kind of took the edge off. Mm-hmm. But uh, I stopped out at the house one day as it was being closer to being uh, finished. I, I was on my way to work and I stopped to talk to the builder. And there was this very strange individual that was on the building crew. He was very odd. And he, his, his, his name comes up throughout the book because he was a very strange individual. His house was up on a hill that oversaw the valley where our house was. So he could see our house. And he's sitting, okay, I I stop and I'm talking to the builder and it's like around lunchtime and he's sitting there, you know, in the garage and he seemed very much uh, on edge. He had a, he seemed like he was extremely uncomfortable. I I kind of ignored him and I'm talking to the builder and all of a sudden he blurts out, there was a man here last night. And I thought for a second and I thought, okay, so my wife had one of her friends and her friend's new boyfriend stopped by and showed him the house. I said, oh, I know what you, I know. I, I, I said, that was just, you know, I, I explained, you know, it's a friend of, the, of, of, of my wife, whatever. He said, that's not what I'm talking about. He said, I had to take my car to the garage to get worked on. If he came down his lane and then took a shortcut across the township road that I lived on, he was only a little over a mile away from the garage. But he said, when he drove down our road, he said, he saw a man standing in the bushes watching the house. Like he was near the road, standing in the high grass and the bushes watching, watching the house. And he said the guy was so scary looking that he dropped the car off at the garage and he had to walk home. He walked like three or I'd say probably three miles out of his way mm-hmm. because he didn't want to walk down the shortcut road and go and see that guy while he's walking and all by himself. I mean, he seemed shook up. And I said, well, I said, um, if anybody messes around here, I said, I have, I have guns. I said, somebody, somebody messes with this, I'll shoot him, you know? And then he seemed kind of freaked out about that too. But the builder was like, yeah, you got it. You got to protect your family, you know? So it was, it was a very strange interaction. You know, I, as the house was then completed, we, we had issues with the builder. A lot of the things we agreed upon, he did not do. 
we've come to find out that he took some very major shortcuts in some areas that should not have been taken. When we moved in, it was very, we lived in this big open valley and, and the wind would blow through there and it would sound like the house was moving. I mean, it was cr- very creepy. And it was funny because, you know, my, my ex would say to me, when you're at work and, and, and it's, you know, start, wind starts blowing, she said, it sounds like we live in a haunted house. She said, I'm hearing noises that are so creepy. And so we, we ended up hiring some house inspectors and they came and looked at everything and they found they identified multiple areas that the builder screwed up. That turned into a situation because we ended up hiring an attorney, paid him a bunch of money. And when it came time to we were going to have to sue the builder, he just quit taking my phone calls. And I discovered, well, they, nobody wants to go against the Amish. And, mm-hmm. and, and that builder is very close to the Amish and he subcontracts to them. So I ended up hiring some gentlemen that I went to church with, some older gentlemen that had worked construction for years, and they came in and fixed everything. We paid them, and it was sad that we had to pay the money twice, but at least the house was ready to go, you know. Mm-hmm. After that, I, you know, I didn't really notice the creepy noises so much or, or anything like that, but other strange things began happening. And one of the first things I remember, I was standing in uh, w- the room that we called the mud room. When you walked in out of the garage, there was a small room that had the washer, dryer, a closet, and a utility tub. And that's where I kept the cats, food, and water dishes. We had we had two cats at that point. I'm sorry, when we first moved in, we only had one. We had Moses. He was a big tabby cat. And I would keep the litter box in the bottom of the closet, and then their, their food was up on a shelf in there. I'm standing there putting food in his dish, and the dryer door opened by itself. Now, you know how a dryer door latches shut. You got to oh, yeah. to get it open. And I kept thinking, how did that door just open by itself? And I thought, man, that's that's weird. You know, I mean, I really did think it's strange, you know, but a while later, we ended up getting another cat. Uh, we had a little kitten uh, named Zoe. And she was a little calico cat. So calicos and tabbies don't really look alike, you know. Mm-hmm. And Moses was a big cat. Zoe was always a very small cat. As a kitten, she was tiny. And one night I'm in the mud room again and my ex, she had already gone up to bed. And before I went up to bed, I wanted to make sure the cats had food in their dish. So I'm in the, the mud room. I, I put food in their dish and Zoe comes running into the room and runs over to the dish and starts eating. And I looked right at her and I thought, how cute. I put the bag of food back in the closet, walked out of the room, walked through the house turned and walked into the foyer. And as I turned to go upstairs, there was Zoe sitting on the top step, staring at me. And I thought that's impossible. She's in the mudroom. I left her in there. She's in the mudroom eating. That's impossible. Mm -hmm. And then I thought that must've been Moses that came in and ate. But keep in mind, I had looked right at her and, and, you know, even took note of how cute she looked sitting there eating, eating. But I thought it had to be Moses. So I walked up the stairs across the landing and opened the bedroom door. And there was Moses sleeping on the bed with my wife. I was like, okay, that is crazy. And I cannot explain this. Mm -hmm. So the next day or so I, I I had to tell her, I felt like I have to tell her this, but she's going to think I'm crazy. And uh, I told her. And when I, when I told her what happened, she said, don't even tell me that. Don't even tell me that. And I was thinking the next thing out of her mouth would be, you're crazy. I'm married to a crazy person, you know, but <laughs> right. what she said was there are times when you're at work and I'm at home alone and I'll be downstairs on the elliptical. We had a workout room in the basement. It was an unfinished basement, a very big basement. And uh, we had like a, you know, a little weight room and we had an elliptical in there and everything. And we never let the cats in the basement. And she said, there are times when you are at work and I'm home alone And I will see Moses run past out of the corner of my eye. She said, I'm downstairs on the elliptical. And I see Moses run past out of the corner of my eye. And and I think there's Moses. And then I remember he's upstairs, the door is shut. He's not even allowed down here and he's not there. So at that point, it was like, I don't understand this because we built the house. How can it be haunted? You know, but I was thinking something's not right. Mm -hmm. And things began to get worse and worse between us. And I, I do believe in, in those environments. This was a demonic haunting, no question about it. And demons are very good at turning people against each other. 
Mm-hmm. They know where everybody's weak. They know what pushes everybody's buttons. And they're going to turn people against each other. That's what they do a lot. A lot of marriages don't survive in that environment. Almost definitely. So we began getting along worse and worse and worse. By uh, 2006, it's like, man, the wheels are falling off. It's, this is bad, you know. And we were not getting along. And very, very strange things happened, okay? We started going uh, to marriage counseling. And one night, this experience I'm going to share, I to this day, I will never forget it. And I cannot explain exactly what happened like it's so strange we had gone to marriage counseling and we came home now at this point we both now keep in mind when we dated she hated scary movies one time we watched a movie with some friends and it was scream and she was furious that we watched it because she hated them by this time now 2006 we're both watching ghost ghost hunters we're both watching a haunting and it was like we both knew something's up here I don't understand it, but there's something not right. And we were both interested in those shows. It got so strange that there were times I came home from work at night. She would be telling me all about the uh, episode of a haunting that she watched by herself in a house in the middle of nowhere. Everything's pitch black outside, you know, and uh, she was watching. And those shows were scary. They were. Mm -hmm. They they use uh, imagery to make the story itself even scarier. So she's even watching us by herself. Well, we come home from uh, marriage counseling. The way the living, the, we called it the great room. It was one of the living rooms and it had a vaulted ceiling and the fireplace was there. And it was like more of a rectangle shaped room. And at the far wall was our television. On the left hand wall across from the fireplace, uh, you know, across the room from the fireplace was where we had our couch. And as like the, you would enter into that big open area, and and enter into that part of the house. That's where we had our love seat sitting facing the TV. So she was sitting on the love seat with her feet up on an ottoman. I was laying on the couch. So she is slight, if I'm looking at the TV, she's like kind of behind me to my right and behind me. The very, the strangest thing, we're watching the show and I felt her presence leave the room. It was very strange. Like, you know, when you feel when you're alone and you can feel when there's somebody mm-hmm. else in the room with you. Right. I felt her presence leave. So I, I th- and I kept thinking, I never heard her get up. You know, I would have still seen movement out of the corner of my eye. You know, so before I even turned to look to see if she was there, I asked her a question. She didn't answer me. I asked her again. She didn't answer me. I turned and looked at her. She had her held, her head was tilted back. She was staring like up towards the ceiling. Her mouth and her eyes were wide open. And it's like a soup, it was like a creepy looking death stare. It looked very, very creepy. And I called her by name and she snapped out of it. Like literally her head jerked and everything. And she said, what? Like real condescending. And I said, uh, did you hear me? I, I said, uh, I asked you a question three times or uh, two, twice, whatever it was because I repeatedly asked her and I said, you didn't even answer me. And she said, I said, are you okay? Or I said, are you okay? And she said, yeah, why? And, 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 and I explained, you know, I'd ask her a question. She didn't answer me. She got a very bewildered look on her face and said, I didn't even hear you. That's strange. What was going on? I can't tell you why I felt her presence leave the room. I can't tell you, I have ideas, but I can't tell you exactly what was going on in, at that moment. I began having strange things like she would be traveling for business quite a bit. And I had things like, you know, I would close the curtains in in the great room. I would walk across the room and sit down on a chair and the curtain would be open. And I would be thinking, I swear I closed that. Mm -hmm. I, I mean, I know I have a lot on my mind, but I swear I just closed that curtain, you know. And then I would, you know, as the marriage got worse and worse and worse. I, I wasn't able to sleep. So I'd be staying up praying and I would be downstairs. I would always feel like somebody was watching me. Fast forward into October of 2006, I came home from work one Saturday afternoon, or I'd say late afternoon, and she was gone. She had left. I wasn't able to even reach her for a couple of days. She told me when I was able to reach her, number one, she wanted a divorce. Number two, that on the previous Friday night, the night before she left, at three o'clock in the morning, she heard someone ring the doorbell and then let themselves in the house. 
And I was like, what are you talking about? I said, I didn't let anybody in the house. You know, I said, I was downstairs sleeping. I said, if somebody would have done that, I would have heard them. She said, I know what I heard. I said, it didn't happen. Well, as I hung up the phone, I'm thinking, I mean, my head's spinning, you know, mm -hmm. I'm getting a divorce. I don't even want a divorce, but I'm getting one. And I'm thinking, what's this about the door? You know, like she's saying, and, and then I kept thinking, she didn't even say that I let anybody in. She's saying she heard someone let themselves in. So that's all very strange. Fast forward into beginning of February of 2007, you know, that whole time between October and, two, and uh, February of 2007, I was alone, didn't really have much activity in the house. So I kept thinking the activity centered around her. She's doing stuff. She probably had people in the house doing stuff she shouldn't have been when I was away. Um, you know, and I'm, I'm thinking it's it's all targeted to her. It, it, it's That's the issue. After the divorce was final, I began having activity that even escalated even more. And some of the things I experienced, it was it was like, okay, this is, you know, this removes all doubt. You know, I thought it was haunted. This proves it, you know. Like, for instance, you know, it was February 11th, 2007. I woke up. It was a Sunday and the house was freezing cold. We had had a snowstorm that began on Friday night, uh, very deep snow. And I had brought my dogs in uh, into the garage. I had big uh, cages in there for them. And I kept them in the garage and I would take them out and walk them so they could go to the bathroom. I didn't want them out in the cold, even though they, they had a nice kennel, but I wanted them warm. I had not even gone around the back of the house since I had brought them in on Friday. All the tracks from when I had gone out to get them were covered in snow. You know, everything was covered in snow. And I'm thinking, you know, how in the world can the house be freezing? I just checked our thousand gallon underground propane tank a week ago and it was at 40 percent that's 400 gallons mm -hmm. so i called my propane supplier it was on a sunday you know and he said i can do an emergency delivery but i gotta charge more but he said before i do that he said why don't you go out and check the regulator on your uh or check the vent on your regulator his and i don't even know what that is you know and i'm like okay can you walk me through it he said sure so i take my cordless phone i go out the patio door I walk around to where the regulator's mounted to the side of the house. The regulator is where the propane from the tank comes into the regulator from underground, and then it goes into the house to the furnace, okay? Mm -hmm. I walk out there. The snow is deep, and it's undisturbed. I walk over to the regulator. I gently push all the snow away from the pipe that comes out of the bottom of the regulator. And when I do that, I see that the, the, the shutoff valve on the pipe is turned sideways. So I said, wait a second. I said, this arm on the pipe is turned sideways. And he said, well, that's your shutoff valve. He said, and I said, could it have been installed? He said, that should be going straight up and down. And I said, uh, could, it, could mine have been installed wrong? And that doesn't make sense, but I'm trying to make sense of how this got turned off because I know I never touched it, you know. And he said, no, it can't be. He said, turn it straight up and down. He said, you will hear the gas go through the line. And then he said, go in and light your pilot lights and you'll have your heat again. He said, you shut off your shutoff valve. That's what happened. And I said, you don't understand. I didn't touch this. And I, I said, I had heat yesterday. Today, I don't. And I said, the snow is completely undisturbed. I said, nobody could have walked up here and shut this off. And he said, well, I can't explain that. But he said, give it, try what I told you. I turned the valve, opened it up. I heard the gas go through the line. I went in, I lit my pilot light, I had heat. That's impossible to happen in, unless there's something paranormal going on. How does a shutoff valve under snow get turned off with the snow being completely undisturbed? And a shutoff valve is hard to uh, move anyway. Yes. And you know, this sounds weird because you, you fast forward to now these different paranormal activity movies and like that, and you'll see the lights moving and then just crash onto the floor. Well, that really happened, you know, um, to me. That same afternoon, um, we had these alabaster colored, uh, like a frost, alabaster frosting light covers on our overhead lights. One that was right over the area where the dining room was, just fell, shattered all over the floor in a million pieces, you know. Mm hmm Totally unexplainable. Lots of lots of things like that began happening. I, I lived in that from, you know, beginning at, well, actually by myself from October of 2006. 
all the way up till February of 2010. So all of that time I had, you know, I'm there by myself and I'm having experiences. There were so many, you know, I, I at one point saw a black mass pass, right? I'm sitting in a great room on the couch, right across from the fireplace. Um, my two cats, Moses and Zoe are sitting in the room off to my left, just sitting beside each other to my right. Now, if you were sitting on the couch and, and looked to your right, you could see all the way to the other side of the house. Mm-hmm. The way we had it designed was very open. I saw a black mass pass right through, like it came in through the sunroom and passed right through that area and disappeared into the foyer. When I saw that, I saw it out of the corner of my right eye and out of the corner of my left eye because I happened to be looking straight ahead when it happened. I saw Moses and Zoe's heads both jerk and move from right to left following the trajectory of the black mass that shot through the room. So they saw it also. They they absolutely did. And I knew I knew that they saw it because, you know, they same time I saw it, they reacted. Again, in the foyer, that happened, you know, went into the foyer. I had times where, you know, the doorbell rang and there was nobody there. I had times where, you know, one time I, I was sitting in the office and it was middle of the night. It sounded like I had not pulled my vehicle into the garage. It was sitting in front of the garage and it sounded like somebody smashed my vehicle, like the loudest crash. I literally spun out of the chair, crawled on my belly over to the window and then crawled out into the foyer and was watching out there. We had those vertical windows on the sides of the door. And I was like, what in the world? There was nothing out of place. There was nothing. One night when I went to go to bed, I walked up and I looked out the window on the front door and it was all lit up around my car. Like like there was a spotlight on my car. And I thought, I must not have turned off the lights on the front of the garage. So I walk through the house. I go shut off the alarm, open the garage door to turn off that light. And the light is already off. I flipped it back on and I could see through the side garage window that a light came on outside. And then I flipped it back off again. I locked everything up, rearmed the security system, went back to the foyer, looked out, everything was pitch black. How that happened? I mean, either somebody, either something else was illuminating my vehicle or somebody or something did turn on that light and then turn it back off. Definitely. It was strange and unnerving. Mm Mm-hmm. At one point I had, you know, I was drinking apple cider vinegar mixed in in, in water at night before bed. And I was standing at my sink in the kitchen and I had no curtains over the window behind the sink. There was an overhead light slightly behind me. So it, at that point, when I look at the, it's pitch black out, it's probably around 1.30 in the morning. When I look at the window, it, it's almost like looking in a mirror. I can see my reflection plain as day. So I, I mix this up and I go to drink it. And as I tilted my head back, you know, you're just natural, natural movement. I tilt my head back a little bit. I'm, I tip the cup up and I, my eyes just fall on the window in front of me. And when I see my reflection, there's like a black shadow person, a, a black mass. I don't know how you explain it. It was completely black and it was standing over my left shoulder. And when I saw it, it disappeared in a downward, downward motion. And I was like, okay, I know that I saw that, you know, I did not imagine that, you know, you know, I had a lot of experiences, you know, it was, it was not a, uh, it was not a pleasant thing to, to go through. Mm -hmm. It, It got to the point I was constantly studying, you know, people would tell me, just leave, just leave the house. Who cares if you lose everything, you got to get out of there. But to me, it was like, no, because if I do that, I lost and I'm not going to lose. I'm going to fight, you know? I would not back down I, and I stayed there, but I was constantly studying, you know, how do you get rid of demons? What do you do? You know, and I kept studying the Bible has a lot to say about it, obviously. And, and, and any ministers who specialized in that, I would get their stuff. I would read it. I would get their videos. I just kept studying. And as I did this, I began, you know, I basically educating myself on that. But I started meeting people that had demons. The people had them. Because of that, then, you know, I started doing exorcism. People would needed help, so I helped them. Because when you when you experience that, you can never go back to not believing in it or, or, or thinking that it's very uncommon. You see the world differently. I'm going to take a short break. I'll be right back with the rest of my conversation with Patrick Meachin right after these messages. 
Ghost stories are always scarier when they're told by the very people who experience them. Hi, I'm Becky. And I'm Diana. And we're the hosts of the Homespun Haints podcast. We talk to people just like you who've come face to face with ghosts, demons, haints, and other strange paranormal phenomena. All of it makes for a chilling good time. So grab yourself a sweet tea, turn off the lights, and listen to some eerie, true ghost stories on Homespun Haints wherever you get your podcasts. I'm not scared. Are you? Okay, now I'm back now with uh, Patrick Meachin. We're going to continue this fascinating story on this haunted house. And I grew up with something like that, so I know exactly what he's talking about. Okay, uh, so imagine that you are, you know, you've educated yourself on exorcism and things like that. And you are actually helping other people get rid of the demons they have inside of them. But then, and again, that experience completely changes you because you see the world completely differently after that. But then you go home and you're still living in a house that you cannot get the demons to leave. And it was, it came to the point where I even, you know, at one point I I even went and saw a very well-known exorcist named Bob Larson, because I, I was thinking, what if, what if the problem's me? What if it's not the house? What if it's me? You know? And, uh, you know, I, in all honesty, I thought that was a very, very valuable experience to have met him and gone, you know, had him pray over me and everything. But I learned from it, but it did not change my house situation. I think the thing I should have done was tried to get him to come to my house and pray over it. Mm-hmm. But basically, you know, imagine going home after doing an exorcism and you're in the middle of nowhere by yourself in this house and you know that there's some pretty dark spiritual things out there that are very unhappy with you because you just cast their bodies into hell, you know? Mm -hmm. And, uh, it was a very, very uncomfortable feeling. A lot of those nights I literally slept on my back with a Bible open on my chest and that's how I slept. That was the only thing that gave me peace to go to sleep. But, uh, you know, this went on and on. I mean, it was very, very difficult. It was very hopeless at times. Basically, I ended up, I, 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 I believe it was a series of events came together that God was leading me out of the horrible situation. I, I think there were some areas where he tested me. And, and, and I, I write about those in the book to explain what I'm talking about. But I believe he tested me to see if I would be faithful. And then he opened doors. And one of the things he did was I, I ended up meeting uh, an old friend from grade school on Facebook. And I had not talked to her in decades. And uh, I'd seen her around town. And I, I always thought she was a Christian because I remembered I'd seen her in Christian t-shirts and whatnot. But uh, she sent me a message and, and we started talking. And she said, and I, and I at this point, I was at wit's end. We are now into 2009. And I've been experiencing this for years. And I really needed to get the house sold. I had put the house on the market in 2007, um, right after the divorce. It had not sold, you know, it was just, and, and, and eventually I'm going to run out of money because I'm paying for this huge house and property by myself, you know, mm-hmm. I, I, I was kind of at wit's end. And I just told her, I said, you, you're welcome to think I'm crazy, but I'm dealing with some really messed up things in my house. You know, I told her what I was dealing with. And she said, here's my phone number. Call me. So I called her and uh, we, she said, I believe you. Cause I, she, she said, I've had experiences before, but she said, where is the house located? And I told her, and she said, well, that's interesting. She said, my husband grew up near there. She said, I'm going to ask him if he knows anything about this. Maybe maybe he'll know something that can help you. A few days later, they called me back. And I had told her, you know, I'm leaving out. I had multiple run-ins with the Amish. And it was very, I had it confirmed to me multiple ways that my neighbors were into witchcraft and the occult. They were cursing me. They wanted my house. They wanted my property. But they don't believe in paying fair market value. They believe in we will take it. You're not one of us. You're an outsider. You're not welcome in Holmes County. You're not Amish. Mm -hmm. So we will do our conjuring to do whatever we need to do to get you out of here. And um, I was convinced. I knew that was going on. And I was convinced at that point, this is the root of my problem. When when they called me back, you know, uh, this girl, her name was Angela. She put her husband on the phone and uh, he said, He said, Angela told me that you think the Amish are cursing you and they're into witchcraft. And I said, yes, I do. 
And he said, well, I guarantee you, you're right about that. But he said, you have a bigger problem. And I said, what's the, what, what is it? And he said, the land you built your house on is cursed. He explained this whole thing to me about, you know, I never knew it till he told me, but my house was right by a treaty line. He explained all this to me. He said, go look it up. He said, I'm telling you the truth. He said, the deal is the Indians lost the land because they didn't abide by the treaty. And he said, so when they lost the land, they cursed everything. The, he said, I was raised Amish, but I didn't join the Amish church. He said, because I was one of them growing up, they told me all this. And he said, but they're never going to tell you. And he said, uh, that's what the deal is. He said, uh, you built your house on cursed land. Basically, the two of them agreed to come and help me. Now, I had had another church group come to the house before they got, before they came, you know, a few weeks before they, they came. And this other group, I'm sure they were well-meaning. I think they were misguided, you know. Um, I think the, the pastor himself was misguided. He didn't, you know, most pastors do not understand how this stuff works. They're mm-hmm. not taught it in seminary. You know, they, they don't re- they haven't really studied the Bible about these specific things enough to know how clear the Bible is about them. And they're never talked about in church, really, none of those things. So they're very uh, uneducated and, and ignorant of the way the devil operates. And uh, so they did come to, to try to help me. The one thing that was very strange when, when that group came, one of the ladies in the group, she said she had a gift of discerning of spirits. Now, the people in the paranormal field, a lot of people say Lorraine Warren was a medium and these the different things. In the book, The Demonologist, she's described very clearly as a person with a gift of discerning of spirits. And that's biblical. And uh, that is the biblical name. A, a medium necessarily isn't considered the same thing. But um, this lady told me, she said, I have a gift of discerning of spirits. And uh, she said, if I can tell you anything, you know, I will. Well, we start praying and we're standing in, in where the dining room table had once been. And we're like in a circle praying. And as we're praying, she says, um, I know its name. It's telling me its name. Do you want to know its name? And I said, yeah, what's its name? And she said, it calls itself the doorkeeper. Now, the way she said that even was so interesting. It calls itself the doorkeeper. And I was already well aware when you do exorcism, one of the main demons you need to deal with in a person is a gatekeeper demon. That demon brings in demons. It lets demons out during an exorcism to try to fool you into believing that you got rid of them all. So you always want to deal with a gatekeeper. And I'm thinking, okay, this is a doorkeeper. It's the same thing, but it's, it's guarding my house and it's bringing other demons in. You know, she said, can I walk around the house? And I said, sure. She goes right down into the basement. Now, this house was big. And, you know, generally when you go into a bigger house, you don't, you kind of lose your way as you start walking through it. She goes right down the stairs of the basement and there was a crack on the front wall that had appeared right after the house was built. They had told me they fixed it. Um, I tried to fix it because it would keep coming back. I tried to fix it myself, but it would always come down right down the front wall of the basement. I had never thought much about it. She walks up to that crack and points at it. And she said, what's directly above this? And I said, the front door of the house. And she said, that's directly related to the, the what's here. She goes back upstairs. She goes to the front door. She said she moved her hand back and forth, like motioning in front of the door. And she said, they come and go through here. And the pastor starts trying to get her to shut up. He does not want her telling me anything else. He's still trying to blame the haunting on me. You got some sin in your life. It's your fault and all this nonsense. And I mean, a couple of times I seriously thought about asking him to leave and going off on him. I didn't want to do that, but I was so fed up. And I felt like the only person who offered me any real value is this, this mm-hmm. lady. You know, she did tell me some valuable things. At that point, you know, they, I had asked them if they would walk the entire property and take communion with me and they wouldn't do it. Oh, it rained. We don't want to do that. All right, whatever. Thanks. Thanks for coming. Have a, have a good night. You know, but when they left, I knew, oh my goodness, all the, this is a huge puzzle piece and it connects to a whole bunch of other pieces. And I knew, I started thinking back, okay, what about the last night my wife was here? She heard someone ring the doorbell and let themselves in. All the, what about the doorbell ringing and no one was there? What about when I would see a shadow walk across the porch and there was nobody there? 
you know, all these multiple different scenarios, uh, they all start coming back to me. So I called my mom. She lived three counties away. And I told her, I said, well, I said nothing left. But I said, I do know I have a huge puzzle piece now that for, for this puzzle I'm in. And I said, I told her about the doorkeeper. And she said, well, you're not going to be out there by yourself tonight. She said, um, I'm coming out there. And I did tell her, I said, it, it, this sounds very strange, but I feel very, very uncomfortable now that I know the name. I feel very uncomfortable. It was more personal at that point. I don't know how else to explain that. She came out to the house that night. She said, I'm just going to stay here if that's okay with you. That, at least you're not here by yourself thinking about all this and, and everything. So she said, I'm just going to sleep downstairs here. I go up to the bathroom and I'm in the bathroom upstairs and I felt the floor shake and I went back downstairs. My mom's sitting there, you know, inside the great room, right by the door that goes to the mud room. And she said, um, do you have one of those door stops that when you flick it, it goes boing? You know what I mean? It's like a big spring. It's a door stop. And she asked me if I had one. And I said, yeah, it's right here behind the door. Why did they, one of the cats hit it? And she said, no, the cats weren't anywhere around. She said, I was sitting here and something flicked the door, the door stop. I said, how long ago? And she said, about five minutes ago. And I said, well, five minutes ago, I felt the floor shaking in the bathroom upstairs. I said, well, I'm going up to bed. And I said, do you want any lights left on? And she said, yeah, just leave the lights on that are on. the. I had lights mounted to the bottom of my cupboards. She said, just leave those on. That'll be fine. So I left those lights on. I went upstairs. The next morning, she told me that she was sitting there and saw that same shot, that black shadow thing that I had seen. She saw it pass right through that room and disappear. But as I had seen it pass from the sunroom into the foyer, she saw it going the opposite direction and it just like disappeared through the wall. Now, now you got another person that has seen this, you know, so basically then, you know, and I believe me, I'm leaving out a lot of stories because there are so many more stories in this whole time period and very, very sinister things. I'm talking doppelgangers, oh, yeah. you know, when I saw the cats, when I saw Zoe and it was not Zoe, that's a doppelganger. There was a point where somebody saw a doppelganger of me. It was not me. And that's all detailed in the book as well, you know, but you know, we we're now into December of 20, uh, or, or I'm sorry, of 2009, Dennis and Angela came to the house. It was a Tuesday afternoon. And uh, they said, look, whatever you want to do, we're on board and we're going to do it in agreement with you. And I said, well, I'm going to take a shotgun approach. And I said, I'm going after every single thing I can possibly think of that might be here. And so we basically took anointing oil. I took grape juice. I took wafers. We, we all took communion. And then, we, you know, we walked the entire property. We anointed the entire house with anointing oil in the name of the Father, Son and Holy Spirit. We bound the demons. We broke curses. I mean, it, like if, if anything that needed done, we did. And, and he, every curse that I could even suspect was it at play was named. And uh, rather it be arrowhead curses, uh, you know, the, the word curses from the Indians or whatever they did to enact their curse to make it more powerful. The Amish curses, you know, all these different things. We named everything. And then I poured the grape juice on the ground and I said, you know, after we took communion, I took communion with the land. And what I mean by that is I, I laid the wafer on the ground and I said that represents the, the body of, of Christ that was broken for us. And I said, and this represents the blood of Jesus. And I poured the grape juice out on the ground and I said, no demonic spirit, no power of the devil can stand against the blood of Christ. By Christ's blood, you are defeated and you are going to leave. There's three believers praying in agreement against you. The Bible says where two or three are gathered in my name, I'm in the midst of them. Jesus said that. That's his own words. I said, so you are going to leave. We're not taking no for an answer. You're leaving. And we were very adamant and we were very, you know, aggressive. I never had paranormal activity in the house again after that day. And the house sold very quickly. It sold so quickly that within 60 days of the day that we did the exorcism on the property, I was moved. I was moved into a new house, an, another house. I'll put it that way. It was an older house that I was buying and the, the nightmare was over. We're going to take a short break and I'll be right back with my conversation with Patrick Meacham. Hello, this is JT, the host of The Paranormal Sun, coming to you live from Tower Studios here in Middle Earth. 
and you are listening to my friend Al on the Ghosts in the Valley podcast. Well, getting back to the, the old house, you said when the preacher came in the house, the other woman, do you think she was a maybe a like a psychic medium? I wouldn't call her that. I would call her she had a gift of discerning of spirits. I think there's people that have that gift and they 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 call that being a psychic medium. Mm-hmm. And I'll, I'll, I'll say it like this. When you have a gift of discerning of spirits, you know things and you discern things that about demons in particular. You have you get you get knowledge from directly from God, directly from the Holy Spirit, and you do really know those things. And I do believe she had that. And that's mm-hmm. what she described it to me as being. Okay, yeah, because I was just thinking, you know, with her knowing about the door and, and, and you know, the... Well, I'll, I'll, I will tell you a story since you mentioned that, though. When I first wrote 225th Street, it was written first, and then Nightmare in Holmes, Holmes County was written second. The books that are out now are second editions, and I released them in the proper chronological order. So 220 was written first. It, it is when in the re-release of the second editions, Nightmare in oh, Holmes okay. County is first. Mm-hmm. But originally, that was re- released in 2015, and, and uh, 225th Street was 2011. I was doing an interview on a, a show after 225th Street came out the first time. The people interviewing me were, it was a, a, a lady and her boyfriend. They were both in, into the psychic stuff and some occult stuff, you know, things like that. They were, they were very, very respectful to me, though. And even like the... The, the, the gentleman that was doing the show, he was very respectful. He asked me a lot of questions about spiritual warfare, was very, very respectful. Years later, when I was writing Nightmare in Holmes County, I just, I didn't want information about psychic material, for instance, but I wanted just an opinion. And the opinion was about a picture that I ended up putting in the book of the front door of the house. I always felt like there was residue on that, on that window on the front of the house that to me, I always felt like I saw a face in the residue and the residue had been cleaned off and came back. Things like that, just strange things. And I, and I, I was just going to ask her opinion because she was really big in the paranormal community and whatnot. And so I sent her a message and I said, can I get your opinion on something? And, I, and she said, sure. So I sent her the picture and I said, do you think I should put this picture in the book or not? That was all I was asking, just get her opinion. She responded and told me that door is a portal. What's that door of, you know, tell me the story. Because I had only discussed 225th Street in my interview with them. I hadn't discussed Nightmare in Holmes County. I hadn't even written it yet. Uh And, uh, And I explained it to her and she said, that door is a portal and demons come and go through it. And I said, how do you know that? She said, when I looked at the picture, now this lady, this lady was a psychic medium. And she said, when I look at the picture, I see orbs going to and fro in and out of the door. So she's telling me the same thing that this lady with the gift of discerning of spirits was telling me that she knew the demons came and went through that door. So that is interesting. When you bring that up, I I, I have uh-huh. to share that. You know, that actually did happen. Uh-huh. And I said, okay. I said, I honestly was only going to ask you if you what your, you know, if I should put it in a book or not. But I said, that's interesting you would say that because I was told that before. It, it definitely confirms, you know, there was some bad stuff there, and that door was a portal. I mean, you know, I was just thinking about that, you know, you know, because you know, you t- talk a lot about you know the power, the power of prayer, mm-hmm. and then the three of you together anointing the house mm-hmm. basically got got rid of all the uh, the demons and whatnot that was in the uh, the house, you know. Yes, it kind of answered my question when I was thinking about maybe a spirit, you know, clinging to you and going to another house. I'm, I'm thinking not with the uh, with the with the Amish incurs things and also uh, Indians. Yes, I, I will tell you that is a legit question, and I have been asked that many many times. How do you know something didn't follow you? Because my next house was haunted as well, and the the, the main thing I can tell you is the next house, two twenty fifth Street, was haunted decades before you know over a decade before I was born. It probably was even before that time. All the activity stopped the day we did the exorcism. And I do not believe that if that exorcism had not been complete, that I would have ever sold the property because I would have lost everything I owned in 2010. I could not continue making those massive payments. The fact that, that everything turned around almost immediately, that, that showed me very clearly, yeah, the exorcism worked. Was 225th Street also in Holmes County? 
No, that was in that's in Tuscarawas County. So it's mm-hmm. that, that's you, you go when you leave Holmes County, you go briefly through Stark County and then into Tuscarawas County. Oh, okay, yeah. You know, it's funny because I moved into this house to 25th Street, and I'm writing. I knew that I was to write my book and share my experience because I felt like, man, I was in a completely, completely hopeless situation and God delivered me. If he delivered me, he can deliver anybody. And people need to know that people need to know this is how you can deal with these terrible experiences, you know? So I felt very strongly I'm supposed to write about this. I began writing Nightmare in Holmes County, sitting in the office at 225th street. But, you know, almost immediately when I moved into 225th street, strange things happened. This is going to sound strange to say, but it was a completely different feeling. Very sinister, very dark, very evil, but it felt different than Holmes County. And I believe that was because they were haunted for because of two different, completely different kinds of curses. Mm -hmm. And and I think there were, it was different kinds of demons that were interacting there. At 225th Street, you know, I move in and the very first night I'm in the house, I'm laying in a uh, little small bedroom uh, across the hall from the bedroom I had picked to be my master bedroom. And I didn't have my bedroom set up at all. I had my, my bed wasn't put together. So I go to that other room and me and my two or two cats laid down in that room and went to sleep. But before I fell asleep, I was staring at this old closet door. And I, and I was just thinking about the woodwork. I, I was thinking like, you know, the guy that built the house did good woodwork. That's all I'm really thinking. And all of a sudden, it's like a voice in my head, a third person, which I believe was the Holy Spirit, said to me, you don't know anything about the history of this house. And then I thought to myself, that's true. I don't know anything about the history of this house. So I said a very generic um, spiritual warfare prayer. I basically said, in Jesus' name, I renounce every sin that's ever happened in this house. And I bind the demons and command you to leave. Well, I was not specific at all, but I, you know, I bound demons and said that prayer and it probably did help me, but I went to sleep. Uh, Strange things began to happen in the house. And I remember at one point I came home from work. I, you know, this was several days later. I I had my bedroom all set up now and my cousin is an electrician and he had set up a satellite uh, dish at the house and he ran wires through the you know, into the bedroom. So I would have a satellite TV outlet outlet in the bedroom and then down in the living room, whatever that he had done that as soon as I moved in, you know, this is, he was completely done with that project days earlier. And I, I, I come home, I walk upstairs, I open my bedroom door. My bed is sitting crooked. Like somebody moved my bed to an, sitting at an angle. And I thought, well, how did that happen? And then I convinced myself that, oh, my cousin was here today, I bet. When I was at work, he came to work on things and he moved my bed. I'll ask him about it tomorrow. I mean, I know he was already done in this room, but maybe he just came up to check something. I'll ask him about it tomorrow. It's nothing to worry about. So I laid down in bed. As soon as I shut my eyes, I believe this was a vision that I experienced. When I shut my eyes, It was like I was instantly standing outside my bedroom door, looking down the staircase, and there was a hooded figure coming up the stairs. Now, what I mean is it looked like a person wearing a black, dark cloak with the hood up. It was like he was just coming right up the stairs. And the, the whole image that I saw was not even like how you picture things in your mind's eye. Everything I was seeing was like crystal clear. The colors were very vibrant razor sharp definition on what I was seeing. And it looked like the hooded figure, I could see its face and it looked like an old man. And he, he looked like he was round shouldered, like he was somewhat, he slouched and uh, he had a creepy grin on his face and he looked like he was dead. And I opened my eyes and I thought, what in the world is that? What, why would my mind be conjuring up these images? I'm not scared. I know my cousin moved my bed. It's, you know, it's nothing to worry about. So I shut my eyes, boom. It's like I'm outside my bedroom door looking down the stairs again. I'm seeing that hooded figure come up the stairs. This happened, you know, multiple times. Every time I shut my eyes, it would happen. So I said out loud, I said, in Jesus' name, I renounce every sin that's happened in this house. I bind the demons and I command you to leave. I shut my eyes and the vision's gone. No more visions. I told four people about that experience. In in every case, I would say, 
there's no way I could live in two haunted houses back to back. That that's impossible. <laughs> but listen to what happened. And I would tell them this experience. I told my mom, my best friend, the girl I was dating and her oldest son, we went out for pizza the following Friday night. And I told him about it. We, I had weird things happen during that time frame, like a pipe broke the whole front living room. It was like it was raining in the house. I mean, it was unbelievable. It just like water pouring out of the ceiling. So that all had to be repaired, you know? And, and I even said, when that happened, I said, if I didn't know any better, I would swear something followed me from Holmes County. As this all was, you know, was going on, you know, I kept thinking something's not right. And I told my mother, I said, something's not right here. I said, I know nothing followed me from Holmes County, but something here is not right. You know, the following weekend, my neighbor from two houses away, uh, I named him Steve in the book. I changed his name because honestly, when you write about this stuff, you get scrutinized. And I don't want to subject other people to that scrutiny by identifying mm-hmm. all of them. To me, it's more important to tell the story than identify every single person and have them be scrutinized. So I called him Steve. And Steve came over, introduced himself, and then he went back home. Well, the following day, my mom and my sister and my brother-in-law stopped by the house to see me. And we were all talking. We were standing on the front porch talking. And Steve comes back over and he's got his girlfriend with him. He, you know, he explains that, you know, you're welcome here. If you need any help with anything, you know, you let us know. We all help each other. And I said, well, I really appreciate that. Thank you. And he said, uh, well, that's the good news now for the bad news. And I interrupted him and I said, you're going to tell me my house is haunted. Now, I just met this guy and I'm making a statement like that, but I, I just knew. When I said that, his his mouth dropped open and his eyes got big and he said, yeah, man, it is. Some dude killed himself in your basement a long time ago. And I turned around and I looked at my mom and I said, I told you so. And she said, you did. And my sister standing there and she's going, oh, no, what's he talking about? Not this again. What's he talking about? And um, because she's thinking you just got out of a situation. This can't be happening again. And my mom's standing there looking at her saying, he told me he thought something was going on here. So Steve says, hey, I got more to tell you. I'll have to tell you later. I got to get home. And he leaves. So I'm kind of thinking, man, what in the world What else he got to tell me, you know? But I knew at that moment, I knew I am to put Nightmare in Holmes County on the back burner. I am to put all my energy into writing and researching this house. And I'm, I'm going to try to get rid of the demons that are here. I am to write this book first. And the title is to be the address to 25th street. And I knew all Mm -hmm. that. Like I knew it like as well as I knew my name, this is how it's supposed to be. So I put all my energy into tracking down everyone who had lived in that house before me. As I started finding these people and if, you know, I'm, I'm leaving out details, but as I'm finding these people, they're all having the same experiences. They all had the same experiences when they lived in the house. But every single family that lived there before me, up until the last family, which they lost everything and lost the house, but everyone else had sold the house to someone else, knowing it was haunted, knowing there was a suicide that had occurred there, and without uh, telling the other family. Every one of those families, when I contacted them, they wanted to talk because they all felt like stuff followed them when they left, and they wanted to get those experiences off their chest. They wanted to talk about it. You know, basically as I'm interviewing these families, their stories are all, you know, so similar, you know, similar experiences with all of them, but none of these families had ever discussed these things with each other. You know, they sold it to somebody else and got out of there. And, but, but when they're talking to me, I'm taking notes and everything's adding up. One thing I ended up finding out, we tried an exorcism on the house and it was not successful. When that happens, one of the main reasons why a demon will not leave is because it has a legal right to be there. In other words, there is a door that has been opened to that demon, and that that door has to be closed, and it has to be forced out. And if you don't do that, the demon's not leaving because it has a legal right to be there. And what I ended up finding out was, now keep in mind, I'll, I'll, I, I didn't mention the date, but the night that I had the experience having the vision of the hooded figure on the stairs it was March 1st, 2010. I ended up finding out that on March 1st, 1958, the guy who had built the house committed suicide in the basement in the root cellar. He shot himself in the head. 
I also found out that what I saw in the vision looked like him. It was not him. It was a demon. But it, it took on his, his likeness. I could have not possibly known that. I didn't even know there had been a suicide. I knew nothing about anyone who had lived in the house at that point. All I knew was I was buying the house from a realtor that bought it at a sheriff's sale and was flipping it. So there's no way I could have known that. Uh, during the, our attempted exorcism, I had another vision. And this time the vision was of a guy about 30 years old, a little bit shorter than me. I'm six foot four. So this guy was around six feet tall, medium build, brown hair. And he came zipping up in front of me. I had my eyes shut and we were praying on the landing at the top of the stairs, which is the same area where I was like transported to in that vision when I was looking down the staircase. Only during the attempted exorcism, I'm really standing there. I, I had this vision of this guy come straight up in front of me and stare me down. And he hated me. And he was sizing me up to see if I really had the faith to stand up to them. And I even said out loud to everyone present, I said, something just sized me up. And I described it to a T. It looks like a guy about 30 years old, brown hair, a little bit shorter than me, medium build, blah, blah, blah. And it, in the vision, after it stared me down like it hated me, it spun around and like disappeared going down the staircase. We ended up going to the basement to attempt more, you know, the exorcism down there as well. But at that point, I never knew that the suicide happened in the root cellar. I did not know where at in the basement. There were multiple rooms. As I found out through more research, there was another individual that had lived in the house before me. In 2006, he was killed in a horrible motorcycle accident. Um, I have reason to believe that the accident itself was caused by the paranormal. I, he was definitely heavily demonized while he lived in the house. He had only lived there about six months. He looked exactly like the vision I had during the attempted exorcism. And when I talked to his mother, he had moved into the house with his mother. And I described that vision. And she's like, that's him. That's my son. I said, ma'am, I promise you it was not your son. I said, this was not a human spirit. And I said, I do believe that what is here played a role in your son's death. And, you know, as I became very close friends with her. And she told me later, she said, you know, it makes me feel terrible. But I think he got possessed in the house and that led to his accident. And I said, you know, I, I didn't want to say that to you because a lot of good people get possessed. Getting possessed doesn't mean mm -hmm. you're evil, you know. Uh, but I said, um, I didn't want to say that to you. But I said, I thought that, too. And she said, I I'm sure of it. As it turned out, one of the legal rights that I believe made the exorcism unsuccessful was in the root cellar. Once I found out where the, the uh, suicide happened, I discovered there was his blood is still on the floor in the root cellar. And, and all the details, I go into a lot of details in this second edition of 225th Street. There is so much information in that book. It's unbelievable. Uh, that's ad added to the second edition because you know, the, the haunting continued, activity continued, more people had terrible things happen to them. The brother of the guy who died in a motorcycle accident in 2014, he went missing from his house in, or his apartment in Worcester, Ohio. And this is very similar to one of those David Polites missing 411 cases. He went missing. Mm -hmm. Nobody knew where he was. Missing persons reports were filed. He was later found in Manning, South Carolina, in a ditch, dead. No cause of death was able to be determined by, the, by an autopsy. And his mother told me that she fully believed that the, his death and the disappearance, all of it was related to the house. I do believe that also. I had mentioned that, you know, a lot of the people thought things followed them after they moved out of the house. And the brother of the individual that was killed in a tragic uh, motorcycle accident you know, he disappears and is found dead, states away. No cause of death could be determined even by an autopsy. They, I, ta I spoke directly to the coroner's office. They, they said, quote, this is a very strange case. This is very weird. They said, we, 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 can't, we can't explain why he died. We don't know. He was 46 years old. You know, that's very strange. Mm -hmm. But, uh, and that, that does fall right in with a lot of the strange cases that David Polites follows in the Missing 411 books. But, uh, you know, after that, even I found out there was another individual that lived in the house who moved and was later in a very suspicious motorcycle accident, was thrown off of his motorcycle. The throttle, I've heard two different versions of this story. Both of them, and, and in my opinion, involve the paranormal. 
but uh, at the very least, he was on his motorcycle midair and the throttle stuck wide open and he was on a dirt bike and he landed going full speed, got thrown into a tree, got thrown off of the motorcycle, broke, I believe it was uh, 21 bones, if I'm remembering correctly, mm-hmm. right around 20 bones he broke, almost died, was wheelchair bound for a long time, you know, had to go through a very painful and, and, and horrible uh, recovery. But isn't it interesting? The other individual on his motorcycle accident, he was thrown, hit a tree, thrown off of the motorcycle. You know, he broke almost every bone in his body, literally. You know, it's how many coincidences do you have to have before it's no longer a coincidence? Thing, And and I outlined that in the second edition of 225th Street. There's so many coincidences. At what point do you have to say, okay, this is no longer a coincidence? Yeah, I don't believe in coincidences. I believe in uh, it happens for a reason. Yes, Yes. And I will tell you, there have been more, there's been more that's happened since I wrote that book. Since I wrote the second edition, even there's been even more. At one point I was driving home from work in 2020. It's in the summertime and and I'm driving home from work and I get right, I'm on the freeway, I'm on the interstate and I get right to where the exit is to go for that town, right? There's the exit, right? There's the town where the house is, right? I get right to that exit, boom, out of nowhere. I see this guy or thing standing in the middle of the freeway. Now, keep in mind, I'm going a minimum of 70, probably between 70 and 80 miles an hour. And there's this person or whatever it is standing in the middle of the freeway. It had, I, I only saw a silhouette. So I, I, even though my lights hit it, I could not make out detail. I could not see facial features. It looked like, Everything was black. The clothes looked raggedy, like torn up almost. I saw black, like frizzy long hair. And this thing was standing in a very strange posture with its knees bent slightly and its elbow, like its arms down, but its elbows from its arms from the elbow down to the hands were up in the air. And it's standing in this weird posture right by the line that separates the two lanes on the freeway. I immediately called 911 and I said, somebody's going to commit suicide. You know, they're standing in the middle of the freeway and I I think they're getting ready to jump. And there were no cars close behind me when this happened. As I then, I went back later, I, I contacted the state patrol. I contacted the sheriff's department. I got a recording of the 911 call to prove I'm not lying. I got the police reports. The, uh, the local police responded from that little town. State patrol responded. And they found no one. They couldn't find anyone there. Shortly thereafter, there's a, I'm going to call it a suicide. There's a horrific accident right in that same area on the freeway. Somebody was going the wrong way up the freeway. In my mind, I have gone back and driven through there multiple times and counted the amount of cars that I would have to pass to get from where that car was first seen going the wrong way to where the accident happened. And you're going to pass a minimum of 12 and as much, as many as 35 or more cars in that stretch of highway. How do you not know that you're going the wrong direction? Right. He hit some guy head on right there at that exit, killed both of them. I believe it was a suicide homicide in my opinion. The guy did have drugs in his system. I don't feel like any of the drugs were hallucinogenic drugs. There had to be other cars that got out of his way. So there's no way he could have not known. Later, another situation where someone drove right to that area, pulled off the freeway, shot himself in the head, killed himself. Okay, so what did I see that night in the freeway? Was it a person going to commit suicide and for whatever reason didn't? Or was it even a person? Because it was a black silhouette. Was it demonic? Was it like a shadow person? You know, that's Mm -hmm. what it looked like to me. But I know I look crazy saying that. (laughs) But anyone who wants to call me crazy, I want them to explain these other incidents that happened in the same spot right after that. Uh You know, I don't think it's coincidental. And I do believe that was all linked to what is in that house at 225th street. I believe that it comes and goes. I believe that there's, I believe there's multiple spirits there. But the reason I say that is I detail in the book, there's people that live around that house that have had very creepy experiences in their houses. You know, it, it really makes you wonder are these coincidences or is there something like extremely sinister there and it is continuing its activity? And that's what I believe. You're thinking that that the street suicide was maybe connected to your 225th street 
maybe I, that demon that was coming up the stairs. My thought was, you know, thank God that you're a Christian, and then and it probably recognized that you were, or it could have took you over like the other ones yes. that did. Oh, I, I I do think that. Yes, that's I your, do. That think your faith that. actually saved you. Yeah, I I do think that, and I'm gonna I'm gonna be honest. I think the reason I think that vision was a vision from God, and the reason He showed me that was He knew that I would bind it, and He knew when when you bind it, you're limiting what it can do. And I think that's why he showed me was because he knew that I would, you know, I would bind it. Okay, there's something drawing people to that area to commit suicide and, or, or, you know, to engage in very dangerous behavior. You know, I, I don't think it's a coincidence. I really don't. <laughs> and, and again, when, when you go through all the details in the book, there's so much that I uncovered. Uh, you know, in 2020, later in that year, two owners of Beyond the Fray Publishing contacted me. And they said, you know, we would like to republish your books. Are you interested? And I said, yes, but there's a lot that has happened since I originally wrote them. And I think if they're going to be republished, all this new information should be added. And they said, we agree. So this is no lie. While I'm having that, I'm checking my phone and I'm at work and where I work, I start hearing loud activity in the room at the end of the hall where I am at. It sounds like somebody's in there, but the room's all dark. And it sounds like somebody's in there rattling. I mean, something big around making all kinds of noise. And I, and I, I thought, well, I'm going to go ahead and see who's screwing around in there, you know? And I walked in, there was nobody there. As soon as they contacted me and I agreed that I was, I would rewrite the books activity started. Wow. I mean, and, and I will say this, I have a lot more to write that will involve <laughs> that kind of thing. Like what I just mentioned, maybe book three, I have multiples. <laughs> I have multiples. I've just been very busy. It's hard to write when, and I will say this, you get attacked when you write, when you write from the perspective I write from, you get a target on your back. Oh yeah. Cause I'm currently writing my first book now on my haunted experience. I was 12 years old, you know, and mine happened between 12 years old and 16 years old. And that was, uh, okay. that was 50 years ago, 50 some years ago. So <laughs> just show you how old I am, but, uh, yeah, I mean, a lot of the things you were explaining, it sounds like some of the stuff's in my book, you know? Yeah. You know, so I can, re I can relate to a lot of what you're saying. Are you having experience as you're writing? I was. Okay. You, you know, and I'm, you know, talking about your faith. Mm -hmm. And I was so ticked off at God that I lost so many parents on my parents, my wife's parents and on cancer and yeah. dementia and Alzheimer's. And my mother died of a disease that only affects one in a million, 10 million people. And mm -hmm. I'm, I have one parent left and he's got dementia. And I'm like, you know. I'm just, I'm just at this four-way stop sign. I'm yelling like to God, like, you know, cursing at him. And like, mm -hmm. you know, why me? Well, you know, well, you haven't yeah. had enough, you know? Yep. And I need a break, you know, and I'm, I'm cursing. I mean, I use another word I can think of to, to God. I'm, I'm just so ticked off at him. Mm -hmm. I go to leave that four-way stop and out of the blue, I mean, this car ran a stop sign that I didn't see at all coming about 70 miles down. This car should have hit me. Mm -hmm. I, sh I shouldn't be here today because this car was going so fast. And in the position that car was in, all I heard the squealing of the tires. I'm turning my wheel just to avoid him hitting me in the driver's door. Wow. And now I'm praying to God. I'm like, you know, oh, help me, God. You know, I hear crunches and this car had went down into the ditch across from me. You know, it should have hit me, you yeah. know. And yeah. I'm thinking, here I am. I was scared to go down praying to God. Yeah. You know, in a matter of seconds. And yeah. so the faith, you know, I mean. Yeah. And I'm like, thank you, Jesus, you know? <laughs> exactly. You know, I had times in Holmes County where, you know, sometimes when you're under an attack, and, and let's be honest, when you're going through the things you're going through with loved ones being sick, you, that's a horrible thing to go through. And mm -hmm. the devil will oppress you because he knows you're hurting. He knows you're upset. He knows you're sad. And, 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 and so he, he just pours it on. That's the way he does. And he's real good at trying to make us blame God for everything that, you know, but he's the one that's making it all worse by just the attacks. But I had experiences like that in Holmes County where I, I couldn't take it anymore. And I would, and you know, if my walls could talk, they could tell you, or my, if my cats could talk, they could tell you, you know, but how strong that that Amish have on those, those businesses in the community. Yep. Same thing, you know, in Holmes County and yes. And all these other Amish communities that, even as far as the Amish mafia goes, you know, so, yeah. So I understand the, the, the stories, you know, that's why I was blown away when I, I first heard that. And then I read the books. I'm like, I could relate to most everything you're saying in there. Yeah. It's, it's, it's very bad. And it is, um, 
I'm telling you, they okay, normal teenagers will party or do stuff sometimes. It's probably not a good idea. The Amish teenagers, it's 10 times worse, if not more. And the things that they get into, I mean, I'm telling you, they're into Satanism and everything else. That's a fact. Drugs, all kinds of things like that. You, you don't just dabble as that as a teenager and then you're unscathed. You carry that into your adulthood, whatever doors you open up. But the thing is... They're already opening the doors. I mean, mm -hmm. I've known Amish people that told me that they jumped the fence and became Mennonite, which is still bad. But they told me that uh, they were taught witchcraft and Satanism in their churches. I have a book that I won't even keep in my house. It's in a safety deposit box at a bank because I, I, I want it for research purposes, but I don't want it in my house. And it is called um, Pow Wow or Long Lost Friend. And it's a witchcraft book that the story is that it, every Amish house has a Bible and that book in their house. They will deny it, but you can, I mean, I'm telling you, I, I fully believe it. And even the things, they, they only believe the parts of the Bible that fit what they want to do, you know? Mm -hmm. But um, I'm not saying there's not some good Amish people, but I'm saying overall that religion is a cult. It is. It, I'm sorry, but it absolutely is. They have their own banking system, their own... Yes. Yes. Uh, they run their, they have their own little city might as well say yes and and yes. if you don't go along with their uh rules uh, as an Amish or Mennonite you know they're going to come in and and make you do it anyway that's absolutely true you don't have a choice yeah that's absolutely right and I, I've and, seen that you know yeah they they absolutely do and and I will tell you I, I had somebody tell me one time that they uh they lived in they grew up in Holmes County and they said they were not Amish and they said, I can tell you that on average, the average Amish girl has her first baby to her dad or her brother. There's so much incest. That don't sound very Christian to me. I mean, no. And it is true. And that, that okay, I'll tell you another one. When an Amish girl turns 12 years old, her dad stands up in the church and says, my daughter is now of age. And then he sits down. What that means is if you go to their house and there's a candle in the window, the doors are unlocked, go in and you can do stuff to his daughter. Aren't they afraid about her getting impregnated or? Well, here's the other thing. That's just another uh, person to work the fields. Honestly, it sounds terrible to say, but some of them are so deformed because of the incest. There's diseases that only Amish get. And it's because of the genetic mutations because there's been so much incest over generations to generations i mean you're, if your community's a smaller knit community how do you not have that yeah but the worst part is a lot of it's right under the same roof because there's so much i mean the dad's done it to the daughters and the brothers done it to the daughters and it's sick right you had said something too in a book i can't remember the name of the cemetery yep that i've had some stories come to me from that cemetery that about Amish having uh, seances or some type of uh, rituals out there in that cemetery. Yes. There, there, yeah, yeah, I, I'm sure of that. And there's a valley that would that doesn't even surprise me that they would do it actually in the cemetery. Mm -hmm. In the cemetery, right? I can tell you, I went there to do a uh, broadcast, a blog talk show on Octo uh, October 31st of 2012. A friend of mine took me out there. And I broadcast live. I thought for sure we would find the people there. But the guy that, that was the host of the whole program that I was part of, he had put the word out that I was going there. And I kind of want to keep it under the radar. I, I wanted to keep it on the down low because I didn't want them to know I was showing up. There, there was nobody out there. But when I crossed, I went. we went first to that graveyard. And I had charged my camcorder battery all day. It was fine. When I stepped across the threshold from the outside of the graveyard to the inside, the battery went dead. Oh, yeah, because uh, the energy. Mm -hmm. Yep. And then we went to the to a, a place called Panther Hollow that's a notorious satanic meeting site. And it's Amish-owned land. It's That's uh -huh. who's doing it, you know? Uh -huh. And uh, the funny part, I, it's not really funny, it's interesting, but my friend that took me, you know, he's a Christian. I didn't really think about anybody being in danger, but... I always prayed like warfare prayers before I go to those places and plead the blood of Jesus over me and whatnot for protection and pray a hedge protection. I went home from that night during the broadcast and didn't think much of it. And he contacted me the following January. So January 2013, I believe it was January. And he asked me if I would, he said, you're going to think I'm crazy. But he said, I think something followed me home. 
when we went there that night. I detail all these, all the de- you know, all of the his stories of why he thought that. There was no doubt in my mind something did indeed follow him. And he had a couple accidents that were terrible. He could have got killed. I ended up going to his house and praying over his house and everything after that. But, you know, that's the thing. You go into those environments, stuff can attach to you. It can follow you. And as my wife said, you know, don't bring this crap home with you. <laughs> yeah. I'll, I'll tell you, like, I, like where I live now, I don't feel that my house is haunted. Mm-hmm. But the amount of paranormal activity I have had, it probably surpasses what I had in the other two houses overall. Mm-hmm. I don't believe the house is haunted. I believe that, you know, when I write about what I've written about, you get messed with. When I start writing, the activity increases. I've had so many experiences in this house, but I don't, I never feel like the house is haunted. But I'll give you an example, though. This is creepy, honestly. And, it, you know, it's funny because sometimes I tell people stories and I've lived in this stuff for so long. Yeah, I don't like it. I'm uncomfortable with it. But it doesn't scare me like it does normal people because I've been around it so much. I understand the spiritual authority, you know, Christians have and whatnot. But it's still, when stuff happens, it makes you uncomfortable. Uh And uh, sometimes it does scare you. But I was watching this movie one night and I, I, I live alone. You know, the movie is the movie is actually it's called the Amityville Murders, I believe is the name of it. And it's about, you know, what what happened before, you know, the Lutz family moved in. It's all about Ronnie DeFeo and what was going on there with them. Uh And I'm laying in bed watching this movie, right? And I'm kind of laying on my side watching the TV. My top sheet, which is like your light blanket, you know, you cover up with, it like floats, like it lifts up into the air right in front of my face and then slowly goes back down. And I'm like, okay, I have a ceiling fan on, but that did not happen from the ceiling fan. (laughs) Right. That is messed up, you know. Mm -hmm. A few minutes later, it did it again. I'm like, okay, this is creepy. I think I shut the movie off that night. (laughs) Oh, yeah. I was watching it because I honestly, for research purposes, research in the point of, you know, I think there's details that play into that whole haunting. And and I've always been fascinated with that story. I know Christopher Quarantino, which it's, Christopher Lutz, you know, the the one little boy that lived there Mm -hmm. in the the Amityville Horror. I know him as an adult, awesome person. And so I've always found that story fascinating, you know. But um, the other thing was I was watching it just for special effect, to watch for special effects because I want to to make a movie about my books, you know. Mm -hmm. So I'm trying to say, well, I wonder how they do that effect or where where are they using green screens, things like that, you know. Right. So I was watching it for those reasons, but something messed with me while I was watching it. It's when you least expect it. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, they're always looking for a, a door cracked open to them. Well, Patrick, it's been my pleasure having you on the show, going to put your links to Nightmare in Holmes County and also to 25th Street in the uh, links below this episode. And it's really been my pleasure having you on. Thank you. It's been my pleasure being on. I greatly appreciate that you asked me to. And uh, thank you so much for having me as a guest. Thank you, Patrick Meachin. It's been my pleasure having you on the show today. I know exactly where Holmes County is. I'm only like two counties away. Do check out the links below. Patrick's books are available at Amazon. And I will see you in two weeks on Ghost in the Valley podcast.